Have you ever wondered what the Philippines was like before the Spanish set foot on its shores? Picture a time when the archipelago was not just a collection of islands, but a tapestry of thriving societies and early kingdoms. This is the epic of pre-colonial Philippines, a time often shrouded in the mists of the forgotten past. Imagine bustling ports and vibrant markets, the hustle and bustle of trade echoing in the kingdom of Tondo, one of the most prominent trading centers of its time. Or visualize the Rajanate of Butuan, its artisans skilled in the delicate craft of goldworking, their wares sought after far and wide. These advanced societies were the heart and soul of the archipelago, a testament to the rich cultural heritage of the Philippines. They form the foundation of a past that is intricate, diverse, and worth exploring. So, buckle up as we journey back in time, to a period often overlooked in our history books. Before kingdoms and empires, the early societies of the Philippines were organized into barangays. Let's journey back in time to when the Austronesians first stepped foot on the Philippine archipelago. Driven by their seafaring nature, they ventured across the vast Pacific Ocean, paving pathways to new lands. The Austronesians were the architects of the barangays, the earliest form of political organization in the Philippines. Each barangay was like a small, independent nation, with its own leadership and community structure. At the helm of these barangays, you'd find the Datu, the chieftain. The Datus were the embodiment of authority in their communities. They were the law, the judge, and the military leader. Their word was law and their decisions were final. Their authority was derived not just from their position but also from their wisdom, courage, and the respect they commanded from their people. But the Datu didn't rule alone. They were guided by the wisdom of the Babylon, the spiritual leaders of the Barangay. The Babylanes were the keepers of the community's traditions and rituals. They were the healers, the seers, the mediators between the physical and spiritual worlds. Their role was crucial in maintaining the spiritual harmony of the Barangay. And then there were the Timawa, the freemen. The Timawa were the backbone of the Barangay, providing the manpower for farming, fishing, and defending the Barangay. They were not slaves, but free citizens with rights and responsibilities to their community. These early barangays were more than just simple settlements. They were complex societies with a well-defined hierarchy and division of labor. They had their own laws, their own customs, and their own ways of resolving disputes. They were self-sufficient, self-governing, and resilient. These small yet complex societies laid the groundwork for the grand kingdoms that were to follow. From the humble barangay rose the great empires of the Philippines, a testament to the enduring spirit and ingenuity of the early Filipino people. From these humble barangays, grand kingdoms and states emerged, showcasing the advancement of Philippine societies. In the heart of Luzon, the kingdom of Tondo rose to prominence. A bustling hub of trade and commerce, Tondo was renowned for its complex socio-political structures. At the helm sat the Lakan, a paramount ruler who presided over numerous datas or chieftains. Each Datu governed a community, maintaining peace and order, and ensuring the well-being of his constituents. Meanwhile, far south in the Visayas, the Rajanate of Cebu flourished. Its ruler, the Raja, held supreme authority overseeing the economic and political affairs of the state. Cebu thrived as a center for trade with merchants from as far as China and India, visiting its shores. Intricate textiles, precious metals, and a variety of spices were among the commodities that filled its markets reflecting its prosperous economy. Yet, further south, lay the Sultanate of Sulu. Its ruler, the Sultan, was both a political and religious leader, embodying the fusion of governance and Islam that characterized the state. Sulu was a critical link in the spice trade, connecting the East and the West. Its culture was a vibrant tapestry of indigenous traditions and Islamic practices, creating a unique identity that still resonates today. These early kingdoms and states were more than just political entities. They were centers of economic activity, fostering trade and commerce. They were melting pots of culture, where indigenous practices intermingled with foreign influences. They were embodiments of the Filipino spirit, resilient, industrious, and adaptable. In essence, these were not mere kingdoms or states. They were civilizations in their own right, each with its distinct political structure, economic system, and cultural practice. They were the pillars upon which the Philippine society was built, shaping its identity and destiny. These kingdoms, with their intricate political systems and vibrant cultures, were the epitome of pre-colonial Philippine civilization. 
The pre-colonial Philippines was not an isolated entity, but a dynamic participant in regional trade and diplomacy. Indeed, the early Philippine societies were like a bee, cross-pollinating ideas and goods across the vast expanse of the Southeast Asian archipelago. Let's journey back to those days and explore the web of connections they spun with their neighbors. The Srivijaya Empire, a maritime and commercial kingdom that flourished from the 7th to the 12th centuries, was one such neighbor. This powerful thalassocracy, centered in present-day Sumatra, had a far-reaching influence that extended to the shores of the Philippine archipelago. The Srivijaya introduced elements of Mahayana Buddhism to the early Filipino societies, influencing their religious practices and art forms. Trade with the Srivijaya also brought a wealth of goods, from precious metals to exotic spices, enriching the local economy. Next, we have the Majapahit Empire, a vast archipelagic realm that held sway from the 13th to the 15th centuries. The Majapahit's influence was felt in many parts of the Philippines, with some areas even coming under its direct control. The Majapahit brought with them Hindu-Buddhist traditions, which blended with the indigenous beliefs of the early Filipinos, creating a unique syncretic culture. The Majapahit also introduced advanced administrative and legal concepts, helping to shape the political structures of the early Philippine kingdoms. Finally, let's cast our gaze farther afield, to the mighty Ming Dynasty of China. The Chinese had a profound impact on the early Philippine societies, through both trade and diplomacy. Chinese porcelain, silk, and ironware were highly prized commodities in the Philippines, while local products like gold, pearls, and beeswax were eagerly sought by the Ming traders. Chinese influences can also be seen in the early Filipino cuisine, clothing, and language. These interactions with neighboring civilizations were not mere exchanges of goods or ideas. They were transformative forces, shaping and reshaping the culture, economy, and identity of the early Philippine societies. Each encounter was like a thread, woven into the fabric of their history, adding color, texture, and complexity. These interactions with neighboring civilizations further enrich the vibrant tapestry of pre-colonial Philippine societies. The legacy of these pre-colonial societies is still evident in the Philippines today, if you know where to look. As we delve into the modern era, we find that the footprints of the past are not entirely washed away. They remain etched on the canvas of the present, influencing the culture, politics, and society of the Philippines in ways both subtle and profound. Take, for instance, the alpha syllabary known as Baybayin. Once the primary script of the islands, Baybayin was nearly lost in the waves of colonialism. But today, it enjoys a resurgence, seen in cultural exhibits, local merchandise, and even on the bodies of those who choose to wear their history in the form of tattoos. The legacy of pre-colonial societies also thrives in the traditional arts and crafts of the Philippines. The intricate weaving techniques, the vibrant textiles, the delicate pottery, and the masterful wood carving all bear the stamp of early Filipino craftsmanship. These arts, honed over centuries, serve as a tangible link to the past, a testament to the skill and creativity of our ancestors. In the political sphere, the barangay system, a form of local government that harks back to the pre-colonial times, continues to function as the smallest administrative division in the country. This system, with its emphasis on local leadership and community involvement, is a living relic of a time when power was decentralized and community-oriented. Perhaps most enduring of all are the indigenous belief systems that have weathered the storms of time. These beliefs, intertwined with the natural world, still find expression in the rituals, folklore, and everyday practices of many Filipinos. From honoring nature spirits to observing ancestral rites, these practices remind us of our deep connection to the land and to each other. The echoes of these ancient societies still resonate in the Philippines, reminding us of a time when we charted our own course, free from foreign domination. The history of the pre-colonial Philippines is a testament to the resilience, ingenuity and vibrancy of our ancestors. From the earliest settlers forming barangays to the emergence of kingdoms and states, their stories are woven into the rich tapestry of our heritage. They interacted with neighboring civilizations, creating a dynamic exchange of ideas, culture, and trade. The legacy of these pre-colonial societies continues to echo through time, shaping our identity and values. Often we find these chapters of our history overlooked, overshadowed by the narratives of colonizers. But it's our duty to delve into these forgotten epics and bring them into the light. 
To appreciate the depth of our past is to understand the essence of who we are today. In reclaiming our pre-colonial history, we not only honor our ancestors, but we also gain a deeper understanding of who we are as a people. Until next time, keep exploring and never stop learning. Today, we explore a significant chapter in the rich tapestry of Philippine history, a period marked by foreign rule, resistance, and ultimately, the relentless pursuit of freedom. Picture a land of diverse cultures, vibrant traditions, and formidable warriors. This was the Philippine archipelago before the arrival of the Spanish, but the winds of change were about to blow. A distant nation, driven by the thirst for wealth, power, and religious conversion, set its sights on these islands. There, an eventual colonization would forever change the course of this nation's history, sparking a struggle for independence that would echo through the centuries. We delve into this transformative era, uncovering the stories of heroism and resilience that continue to shape the Philippines to this day. Have you ever wondered how a tropical archipelago in Southeast Asia became a Spanish colony for over three centuries? It all began in the year 1521, when a Spanish expedition led by the intrepid Ferdinand Magellan arrived on the shores of what is now known as the Philippines. The first encounters were far from peaceful, marked by skirmishes with local chieftains such as the brave Lapu-Lapu and the diplomatic Raja Humabon. Yet, despite these initial clashes, the Spaniards' persistence paid off. The Manila Encomienda system was established, a system that allowed the Spanish crown to grant land and the labor of the indigenous people to its colonists. This marked the dawn of Spanish rule, a period that would span more than three centuries, imprinting an indelible mark on the culture, religion, and social fabric of the archipelago. The Spanish had set foot, forever altering the course of Philippine history. Imagine living under the rule of a distant king in a land where your culture and identity are suppressed. Welcome to the Spanish reign in the Philippines, an era marked by cultural clashes, societal transformations, and the birth of a unified nation under one government and one religion. The Spanish, in their quest for power and dominance, sought to weave the diverse Filipino ethnic groups into one fabric, under the banner of Spain and the cross of Christianity. The Spanish missionaries, with their fervor for spreading the gospel, introduced Christianity to the islands. This new faith, though initially met with resistance, gradually seeped into the fabric of Filipino society. It brought about a seismic shift in the spiritual landscape of the islands, replacing the indigenous animistic beliefs with the teachings of Jesus Christ. Today, the Philippines stands as the only predominantly Christian nation in Asia, a testament to the enduring influence of the Spanish reign. Beyond religion, the Spanish also brought about significant societal changes. They established towns and cities complete with churches, municipal halls, and plazas based on the gridiron plan. This structured approach to urban planning was a stark contrast to the dispersed, kin-based settlements of pre-colonial Philippines. The introduction of the encomienda system, a form of land grant, further restructured the rural landscapes and the social hierarchies. Yet, all these changes came at a cost. The Spanish suppressed local traditions and practices, viewing them as primitive and pagan. They imposed their language, laws, and customs, leaving little room for the indigenous culture to flourish. The natives were forced to pay tributes, work in the encomiendas, and serve as soldiers or laborers in the galleon trade. They were subjects in their own land, living under the whims and fancies of a distant king. The Spanish era was a time of profound change, setting the stage for a brewing revolution. As the sun set on the Spanish reign, the seeds of discontent were sown, paving the way for an era of struggle, resistance, and ultimately, the quest for independence. What happens when a people yearn for freedom and their voices are silenced? Imagine the Philippines under the iron fist of Spain, a land of beauty and promise, yet stifled by oppression. As the years wore on, the simmering discontent among Filipinos against the Spanish rule was becoming impossible to ignore. The people had had enough. The seeds of revolution were planted by the propaganda movement. This wasn't a group of rabble-rousers, no, these were educated Filipinos, intellectuals who saw the injustices and sought to bring about peaceful reforms. 
They believed in the power of words over violence, in the might of the pen over the sword. Among these reformists, three names stood out. Jose Rizal, Marcelo H. Del Pilar, and Graciano Lopez Jaina. Each of them had a unique role in nurturing the spirit of revolution. Jose Rizal was a man of many talents, a writer, a poet, a doctor, and a national hero. His novels, Noli Me Tangere and El Filibusterismo, exposed the evils of the Spanish friars and the government. They became the catalysts for the revolution. Marcelo H. Del Pilar, known for his fiery editorials, used his pen to criticize the Spanish authorities and the friars. His words were like a clarion call, awakening his countrymen to the realities of their plight. And then, there was Graciano Lopez Jaina, a gifted orator who could rouse the crowds with his impassioned speeches. His words echoed the sentiments of his people, their dreams of freedom, their yearning for justice. These three men, along with others in the propaganda movement, were the torchbearers of change, their peaceful pleas a desperate cry for justice and equality. Yet their voices fell on deaf ears, their pleas ignored by the Spanish rulers. And so the seeds of revolution grew, watered by the tears of a people longing for freedom, strengthened by their resolve. The peaceful pleas of the reformists fell on deaf ears, their words ignored, their entreaties unheeded. And thus, the spark of a bloody revolution was ignited. Yet peaceful pleas fell on deaf ears, igniting the spark of a bloody revolution. Can you hear the cry for freedom echoing through the ages? Let's travel back in time to late August 1896, where a spark ignited the flame of revolution. A flame that would eventually consume the entire Spanish colonial rule in the Philippines. In the barrio of Pugad Lawin, a group of revolutionaries known as the Katipunan, led by Andres Bonifacio, gathered. They were ordinary Filipinos, farmers, craftsmen, and laborers. But they had an extraordinary dream, to free their motherland from the shackles of Spanish oppression. The Katipunan, which had been operating in secrecy for years, had been discovered. The Spanish authorities were closing in, and the time for quiet resistance was over. On that fateful day, Bonifacio, the supremo of the Katipunan, stood before his fellow revolutionaries. He held up a cedula, the resident certificate issued by the Spanish colonial government, a symbol of their subjugation. With a passionate cry, he tore the cedula apart, a powerful, symbolic act of defiance against their oppressors. This was the cry of Pugad Lawin, the first act of revolution against Spanish rule. It was more than just a call to arms. It was a call to unity, a call to dignity, a call to freedom. It was a moment that would forever be etched in the annals of Philippine history. The significance of the cry of Pugad Lawin cannot be overstated. It marked the turning point in the struggle for Philippine independence. It was the moment when words of protest turned into actions of rebellion. It was the moment when the dream of freedom became a tangible goal, a cause worth fighting and dying for. The cry of Pugad Lawin was a declaration to the world that the Filipinos, though under the yoke of colonial rule, were not mere subjects. They were a nation, a people united under the banner of liberty, ready to fight for their right to self-determination. The cry for freedom was now a roar, a war against colonial rule had begun. How does a nation born out of struggle and sacrifice honor its hard-won freedom? It begins with a spark, a revolution. The Philippine Revolution, that is. The year was 1896, and the Filipino people, weary of Spanish rule, rose in open rebellion. The Battle of Manila Bay, a pivotal event in this revolution, was a testament to their audacity. Against all odds, the Filipino revolutionaries, under the leadership of Emilio Aguinaldo, stood their ground. Their courage was unwavering, their hope unshaken. It was in this very battle that they demonstrated to the world that they were not mere subjects to be ruled over, but a people, a nation, capable of defending their own. In the face of overwhelming odds, Aguinaldo's courageous leadership rallied the Filipinos. His was a voice that echoed through the valleys, across the fields and over the mountains, stirring the hearts of his people. It was his call that led them to stand against the might of the Spanish Empire, his vision that spurred them towards their hard-won freedom. Then came the day every Filipino had been fighting for. In the summer of 1898, the Declaration of Independence was made. 
The Spanish rule that had gripped the nation for over three centuries was finally over. The Philippines was free at last. But freedom was more than just a political state. It was a symbol, a testament to the resilience of the Filipino spirit. The Philippine flag, with its vibrant colors and meaningful symbols, and the national anthem, with its stirring lyrics, were born out of this newfound freedom. These symbols, born of struggle and sacrifice, became the embodiment of the Philippine identity, a testament to a nation's triumph over adversity. From the ashes of conflict, a new nation rose, its spirit unbroken, its resolve unyielding. The story of the Philippine struggle and triumph is not just a tale of a nation's past, but a beacon of hope for the future. A reminder that even in the darkest of times, the human spirit can prevail. It is a story that continues to inspire, a story that is still being written. Why should we remember the Spanish colonial era and the struggle for independence in the Philippines? Let's reflect on the tapestry we've woven together. We began with the dawn of colonization, a time of change and adaptation. We journeyed through the Spanish reign, marked by both oppression and cultural fusion. We witnessed the seeds of revolution sown and heard the resonant cry of Pugad Lawin, a rallying call for liberty. We celebrated the struggle and triumph, the hard-won independence that shaped the Philippines we know today. This era, fraught with challenge and change, has left an indelible imprint on the contemporary Philippine society. It shaped the culture, the traditions, even the very identity of the Filipino people. It's in the language spoken, the festival celebrated, and the spirit of resilience that continues to thrive. History, after all, is not just about the past. It's about understanding our present and shaping our future. Have you ever wondered how the American period shaped today's Philippine sovereignty? To truly grasp this, let's step back in time before the American period to when the Philippines was under Spanish rule, a time that lasted for more than three centuries. The late 19th century, an era of revolution and change, saw the Spanish-American War in 1898. This conflict was a significant turning point for the Philippines. It was here, in the aftermath of this war, that the archipelago found itself in a new set of hands, the Americans. But what does this have to do with sovereignty? Sovereignty, in essence, is the full right and power of a governing body to govern itself without any interference from outside sources or bodies. It's the ability to exercise self-governance, to make decisions that are in the best interest of one's own nation. For the Philippines, the switch in colonial powers from Spanish to American rule brought about a new question, a question of sovereignty. Under American control, the Philippines was a territory, not a sovereign nation, which meant that its governance was dictated by a foreign power, not by its own people. However, it's important to note that the American period was not just a time of subjugation. It also marked the beginning of the Philippines' journey towards self-governance and ultimately, sovereignty. It was during this period that the seeds for independence were sown, setting the stage for the eventual emergence of the Philippines as a free and sovereign nation. This period of history is marked by many complexities, challenges, and transitions, and it's crucial to understand its context to fully appreciate the trajectory of Philippine sovereignty. As we delve deeper, let's understand the tumultuous journey towards independence. In 1898, the Spanish-American War marked the beginning of a new era. This conflict, rooted in the struggle for control over the remnants of Spain's once vast empire, saw the United States emerge as a new global power. The war ended swiftly with the signing of the Treaty of Paris in late 1898. This treaty, however, had far-reaching implications. It not only ended Spain's control over its remaining colonies, but also marked the beginning of American imperialism. One of the stipulations of the treaty was the cession of the Philippines to the United States. This move, controversial as it was, marked a pivotal shift in the Philippine narrative. No longer under Spanish rule, the Philippines found itself grappling with a new colonial master. With this shift in power, the stage was set for a new chapter in Philippine history. The transition from Spanish to American control was not a peaceful one. The turn of the 20th century saw the Philippines caught in the throes of a new conflict, this time with the United States, in what we now call the Philippine-American War. This war, which spanned from 1899 to 1902, 
was a critical juncture in the Filipino struggle for sovereignty. It was a direct resistance against the newly established American control over the islands. The Filipinos, having just shaken off three centuries of Spanish rule, were not about to simply trade one colonizer for another. At the heart of this war was the question of sovereignty. The Filipino revolutionaries, led by Emilio Aguinaldo, saw it as their continued fight for independence. They had been fighting the Spaniards for freedom, and they were ready to extend that fight to the Americans. The war was brutal and costly. As is often the case, it was the civilians who bore the brunt of the conflict. Villages were razed, lives were lost, and atrocities were committed on both sides. It was a dark period in the island's history, but it was also a testament to the Filipino spirit of resistance and the quest for self-determination. The Philippine-American War ended in 1902 with the capture of Aguinaldo and the official surrender of the Filipino forces. Despite the defeat, the war had a significant impact on the Philippines and its relationship with the United States. It marked the beginning of a long and complex journey towards self-governance. The war also sowed the seeds for future movements for independence. It instilled in the Filipino people a sense of national identity and a desire for sovereignty that would continue to grow in the years to come. The fight for independence was far from over. Despite the resistance, American control prevailed, but the seeds of independence were sown. The Philippine-American War was a pivotal chapter in the Filipino quest for sovereignty, a struggle that would culminate in their eventual independence on July 4, 1946. The quest for sovereignty was a gradual process. It was a path strewn with trials, tribulations, and triumphs. A path that saw the Philippines taking significant steps towards self-governance, stepping out of the shadows of American rule, and marching towards the dawn of independence. One of the most critical milestones on this road was the establishment of the Commonwealth of the Philippines in 1935. This autonomous government served as a transitional phase, a stepping stone from being a United States territory to becoming an independent nation. The Commonwealth was a beacon of hope, a symbol of the impending sovereignty that the Philippine people had been yearning for. And at the helm of this transformative journey was a key figure, a beacon of light guiding the nation towards self-rule, Manuel L. Quezon. Quezon, the first president of the Commonwealth, was an exemplary leader, a visionary who believed in the power of the Philippine people to govern themselves. His leadership was instrumental in steering the nation towards autonomy. Under Quezon's leadership, the Commonwealth pursued a policy of Philippinization, replacing American officials with Filipino counterparts and nurturing a sense of national identity. Quezon also championed the adoption of a national language, a move that further solidified the growing sense of unity and nationhood among the Philippine people. He was a tireless advocate for the rights and interests of his countrymen, and his contributions to the cause of self-governance were immeasurable. But the road to self-governance wasn't without its challenges. The looming threat of the Second World War and the subsequent Japanese occupation of the Philippines in the early 40s proved to be significant obstacles. Yet, the Philippine people remained resolute, their spirit unbroken, their resolve unwavering. The path to self-governance was paved, but the ultimate goal of independence was yet to be achieved. The dream of sovereignty, of a nation free from foreign rule, was still a distant horizon. But the journey had begun, and each step taken, each milestone crossed, brought them closer to the dawn of a new era, an era of independence, of self-governance, and of national pride. On July 4, 1946, a new nation was born. Not just any nation, but a nation that had endured centuries of foreign rule, wars, and a relentless pursuit for self-governance. Yes, we're talking about the Philippines, an archipelago in Southeast Asia that finally saw its dawn of independence on this very day. Independence Day, July 4, 1946, signifies a pivotal moment in the history of the Philippines. It marked the end of nearly five decades of American control and the birth of Philippine sovereignty. This day was not just about the lowering of the stars and stripes and the raising of the Philippine sun and stars, but also about the assertion of the Filipino identity the celebration of its culture and the recognition of its own governance. The significance of this day cannot be overstated. It was a day of jubilation, a day of relief, a day of pride. But more than anything, it was a day of hope. 
hope for a nation finally free to determine its own destiny, to shape its own policies, to make its own mistakes, and to celebrate its own successes. The transition from American control to Philippine sovereignty was not a mere overnight affair. It was a gradual process, filled with negotiations, agreements, and disagreements. It was a journey fraught with challenges, but it was a journey that the Filipinos undertook with unwavering determination and an unyielding spirit. The end of American control did not mean the end of American influence. The echoes of their governance can still be seen in various facets of the Filipino society, from its legal system to its educational institutions. And yet the Philippines has managed to create its own unique identity, blending its rich cultural heritage with the influences of its past rulers. And thus, the quest for sovereignty was realized, shaping the Philippines as we know it today, a nation that stands tall, proud of its past, confident in its present, and optimistic about its future. A nation that, despite its tumultuous history, has managed to carve out its own path, its own identity, its own destiny. Picture this. It's the early 1940s. World War II is in full swing, and the Japanese Imperial Army lands on the shores of the Philippines. As the waves of the Pacific Ocean lap against their boots, the soldiers of the rising sun cast an ominous shadow over the tropical paradise. The invasion was swift, the occupation inevitable. The Philippines, a strategic jewel in the Pacific theater, found itself at the heart of a global conflict, its fate tied to the whims of warring giants. But why the Philippines? Its geographical location provided the Japanese forces with a stepping stone to the vast resources of Southeast Asia. Its sprawling archipelago with its myriad of islands was a natural fortress that could be exploited to keep the Allied forces at bay. The Japanese, with their eyes set on regional dominance, saw in the Philippines a prize too valuable to ignore. Resistance was inevitable as brave Filipinos took up arms against the invaders. The initial clashes were fierce, the defenders resolute. The Battle of Bataan, a grim testament to their fortitude, saw Filipino and American forces making a gallant stand against the relentless Japanese onslaught. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, they held the line, buying precious time for their allies elsewhere. However, even the bravest of hearts can only hold out for so long. After three grueling months, Bataan fell. Not long after, the island fortress of Corregidor, the last bastion of resistance, was also captured. The Philippines was now under the iron grip of the Japanese. Yet the spirit of the Filipino people remained unbroken. In the face of adversity, they braced themselves for the trials to come. Little did they know, the worst was yet to come. And so began a period of harsh occupation, marking a dark chapter in the history of the Philippines. As the sun rose on this new era, the Filipinos found themselves living under the shadow of a foreign power. In the heart of the Pacific, the Philippines, a vibrant archipelago, was plunged into a harsh reality. The Japanese occupation during World War II brought with it a slew of hardships for the local population. The Filipinos were thrust into a world where their freedom was merely a memory, replaced by the oppressive rule of a foreign regime. Forced labor was one of the most grueling aspects of life under occupation. Men and women, young and old, were compelled to work tirelessly in service of the occupiers. They labored on roads, airfields, and other infrastructure projects, often under brutal conditions. The toll on their physical and mental health was severe, but they carried on, driven by the hope of survival. The economic hardship was no less severe. The Japanese introduced Mickey Mouse money, a fiat currency which quickly plummeted in value. The resulting hyperinflation devastated the local economy. Basic necessities became luxuries, with families struggling to put food on the table. Starvation was widespread, as was disease. Yet the Filipinos held on, their resilience tested to the extreme. The occupiers also sought to reshape the cultural landscape. They instituted a strict military rule, suppressing dissent and curtailing civil liberties. Japanese language and customs were imposed in an attempt to overwrite the rich tapestry of Filipino culture. A puppet government was established, with locals forced to pledge allegiance to a regime that cared little for their welfare. But the Filipinos were not passive victims. They endured, they adapted, and they resisted. 
In the face of adversity, they clung to their identity, their traditions, and their dignity. They kept their culture alive, passing it on to the next generation, ensuring that the spirit of the Philippines would not be extinguished. Yet, amidst the hardship, the spirit of resistance was kindling. The story of the Filipino people under Japanese occupation is one of resilience, defiance, and an indomitable will to survive. It's a testament to the strength of the human spirit and a reminder that even in the darkest of times, hope persists. Beneath the iron fist of the Japanese rule, a flame of resistance was quietly growing. This flame was stoked by courageous Filipinos who refused to bow to their oppressors, forming guerrilla groups that would become a thorn in the side of the Japanese forces. One such group was the Hukbala Hop, a revolutionary army formed by farmers and peasants from central Luzon. Their ranks swelled quickly, reaching over 10,000 members by the end of 1942. They focused on sabotaging Japanese operations, disrupting supply lines, and providing aid to the local populace. Further south, in the Visayas, the Free Panay guerrilla forces were hard at work. This group was an amalgamation of various smaller resistance groups unified under a common goal to liberate their homeland. They were instrumental in gathering intelligence, often risking their lives to provide the Allied forces with invaluable information about Japanese troop movement and fortifications. In the mountainous regions of northern Luzon, the United States Armed Forces in the Philippines, North Luzon, or USANL, were in operation. Led by the charismatic Russell W. Volkman, they played a key role in supporting the local population, providing food, medical aid, and even education. Not all heroes wore uniforms, however. Women like Josefina Guerrero, known as Joey, risked their lives to smuggle vital information and supplies. Diagnosed with leprosy, Joey used her condition to evade Japanese scrutiny, delivering maps and reports undetected. These guerrilla groups were a beacon of hope in a time of despair, a testament to the indomitable spirit of the Filipino people. Their acts of defiance were not just a blow to Japanese morale, but also a lifeline to those suffering under occupation, a constant reminder that freedom was not forgotten. These brave men and women kept the hope of freedom alive, even as the war raged on. As the tide of the World War II began to turn, the Philippines found itself on the road to liberation. The return of General Douglas MacArthur and the Allied forces marked a pivotal moment in the history of the Philippine Islands. MacArthur, a man of his word, had promised to return to the Philippines after being forced to retreat to Australia by the Japanese in the early days of the war. In October of 1944, he fulfilled that promise, stepping ashore at Leyte Gulf in the eastern Visayas region, accompanied by a massive force of American and Australian soldiers. This marked the beginning of the end of Japanese control over the Philippines, as the Allied forces began a fierce campaign to reclaim the islands. The Battle of Manila, which took place in the early months of 1945, was one of the most significant battles of the liberation. It was a brutal, month-long conflict that saw the city reduced to rubble. Despite the heavy losses, the Allied forces, aided by Filipino guerrillas, pushed the Japanese back, liberating the city and marking a significant turning point in the war. The role of the guerrilla groups cannot be understated. They provided invaluable assistance to the Allied forces, supplying intelligence, sabotaging Japanese operations, and taking part in direct combat. Their courage and resilience were instrumental in paving the way for the liberation of the Philippines. This road to liberation was a long and arduous journey. It was marked by immense sacrifice and loss, but also by unyielding resilience and a desperate yearning for freedom. The Filipino people, aided by their allies, fought tooth and nail to reclaim their homeland from the grip of the Japanese occupation. In the end, the cost was heavy. The city of Manila was left in ruins, its once vibrant streets reduced to rubble and ash. But beneath the devastation, there was a glimmer of hope. The Philippines, after three long and harrowing years, was finally free. With the city of Manila in ruins, the Philippines was finally free from the clutches of the Japanese occupation. The echoes of the past remind us of the resilience of the Filipino spirit during the Japanese occupation. A period marked by struggle and sacrifice, the occupation left a profound impact on the Philippines and its people. 
the echoes of this era reverberate through time, reminding us of the strength and determination of a nation under duress. In the wake of the occupation, the Philippines faced a monumental task. Cities lay in ruins, the economy was shattered, and countless lives were lost. Yet the indomitable spirit of the Filipinos was not crushed. They rose from the ashes, determined to rebuild their homeland. The post-war rebuilding efforts were nothing short of heroic. From the scattered remnants of their ravaged nation, Filipinos painstakingly built a new future. The effects of the war were long-lasting, and its scars are still visible in the tapestry of the nation. The memories of the hardships endured, the sacrifices made, and the lives lost linger in the collective consciousness of the Filipinos. These memories serve as a stark reminder of the resilience of a people who refused to surrender their hope and spirit, even in the face of extreme adversity. The occupation also had a profound effect on the cultural and social fabric of the Philippines. It shaped the nation's identity, instilling a deep-seated resilience and an unwavering commitment to freedom. This period of history has become a cornerstone of the national narrative, a testament to the courage and tenacity of the Filipinos. Yet, amidst the pain and suffering, the occupation also brought about a sense of unity among Filipinos. The shared experiences of struggle, resistance, and liberation forged a collective identity, a sense of national pride that continues to resonate today. The journey from occupation to liberation serves as a testament to the enduring spirit of the Filipinos, their courage, and their unwavering hope for freedom. Through the darkest chapters of their history, they have shown the world the strength of their spirit, the depth of their resilience, and the power of their hope. Imagine a country utterly devastated by war, its cities in ruins, and its people in despair. How does it rise from the ashes and rebuild itself? In the mid-20th century, the Philippines found itself in such a predicament. World War II had left the nation battered and broken. Infrastructure was decimated, leaving behind a landscape of rubble and ruin. Buildings that once stood tall were now mere skeletons, their brick and mortar insides exposed to the world. Transportation systems were in shambles, making the movement of goods and people a Herculean task. But the physical destruction was only one half of the devastation. The war had displaced countless individuals, tearing families apart, and leaving millions without homes. The Filipino people were faced with the monumental task of rebuilding not just their homes and cities, but their lives. Yet, within this bleak landscape, there was a spark of resilience. The Filipino spirit, known for its strength and determination, refused to be extinguished. The people banded together, helping each other salvage what they could from the wreckage. They shared food and resources and provided comfort and companionship in a time of shared hardship. The challenges were immense, from the scarcity of resources to the sheer scale of destruction. But the Filipino people, armed with their unwavering spirit, faced these challenges head on. They cleared rubble, rebuilt homes, and slowly but surely began to restore their nation. Amidst this period of struggle and reconstruction, a new chapter in Philippine history was being written. In 1946, the Third Republic was established. This marked a significant shift in the nation's governance, signaling a move towards self-determination and independence. The Third Republic served as a beacon of hope, a symbol of the nation's resilience and its capacity to rebuild from the ashes of despair. The journey to reconstruction was not an easy one, but the Filipinos faced it head-on, paving the way for the establishment of the Third Republic. But what happens when a leader, promising progress and prosperity, takes the helm? Enter Ferdinand Marcos, a man of charisma and eloquence. His rise to political prominence began in the early 50s when he was elected as a representative of Ilocos Norte, his home province. Marcos was a lawyer by profession and a decorated war veteran, qualities that helped him draw public attention and admiration. In 1965, he ascended to the highest office of the land, becoming the 10th president of the Philippines. His campaign was built on promises of a new society, a vision of a prosperous and disciplined nation. Marcos vowed to tackle corruption, 
improve infrastructure, and uplift the lives of ordinary Filipinos. His charisma and bold vision garnered him a significant following, and many Filipinos pinned their hopes on his leadership. The early years of the Marcos presidency were marked by notable economic growth. Infrastructure projects sprouted across the nation, and the living standards of many Filipinos improved. Marcos was praised for his economic reforms and his push for industrialization. His administration was seen as a beacon of hope, a period of optimism that promised a brighter future for the Philippines. However, beneath this facade of progress, there were whispers of political suppression, questionable wealth, and growing public discontent. The charismatic leader, once hailed as a visionary, was slowly becoming a divisive figure. In the eyes of many, Marcos was a symbol of progress and prosperity. Others, however, saw him as a cunning politician, using his charm and promises to mask a more sinister agenda. The truth, as it often is, was somewhere in the middle, a complex narrative of a man, his vision, and the power he wielded. Marcos's rise to power was marked by promises of progress, but as we'll see, the reality was much more complex. What if one day, your rights and freedoms were suddenly taken away under the guise of national security? This was the grim reality for the people of the Philippines in 1972, when President Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law. Marcos, who had been in power since 1965, claimed that the country was in a state of rebellion and disorder, instigated by alleged communist insurgents and radical political opponents. He argued that martial law was necessary to preserve the peace and stability of the nation. However, the reality of life under martial law was far from peaceful. Marcos, along with his allies, used this state of emergency as a means to consolidate power. They silenced opposition, suppressed freedom of speech, and curtailed civil liberties in the name of national security. Under the cover of martial law, human rights abuses became rampant. Thousands of Filipino citizens were arrested without proper trials. Many were tortured, and some even disappeared, their fates unknown to this day. The government controlled the media, censoring any content that criticized Marcos or his regime. Political dissent was not tolerated. Opposition leaders were arrested, and political parties were dissolved. Marcos used the military to maintain control, replacing elected officials with military officers and loyalists. Economic policies were manipulated to favor Marcos's cronies, leading to widespread corruption. The country's economy suffered, and the gap between the rich and the poor widened. The promise of peace and order under martial law turned out to be a facade for a regime marked by violence, corruption, and fear. Despite the oppression, the Filipino spirit was not easily broken. Resistance movements began to form in secret, setting the stage for a revolution that would eventually topple the Marcos regime. Martial law was a dark period in Philippine history, a time of fear, oppression, and the curtailment of freedoms. Yet it was also a time of resilience, a testament to the strength and courage of the Filipino people in the face of adversity. But what happens when a nation, pushed to its limits, decides to fight back? This question was answered in the Philippines in the mid-80s when the tension reached a boiling point. One event that sparked the flame was the assassination of Benigno Aquino Jr. on a tarmac in Manila in August of 1983. Aquino, a prominent critic of Marcos and a beacon of hope for many Filipinos, was gunned down upon his return from self-imposed exile. His death ignited a nationwide outrage, an outcry for justice, and a demand for change. In the following years, the opposition to Marcos grew stronger and more unified. Ordinary people, students, professionals, religious figures, and even some military officials started to question the regime's legitimacy and its blatant disregard for human rights. The economy was in shambles, corruption was rampant, and the people were tired. The turning point came in February of 1986, known as the People Power Revolution. It was an event that was as remarkable as it was unexpected. In what is now known as the EDSA Revolution, named after the Epifanio de los Santos Avenue, where the majority of the protests took place, millions of Filipinos gathered in a peaceful demonstration of unity and defiance. The revolution was a testament to the power of peaceful protest. There were no guns fired, no violent clashes, 
just the overwhelming presence of a people united in their desire for change. It was a revolution of flowers and prayers, of songs and tears, of courage and hope. And it worked. Four days later, on the 25th of February, Ferdinand Marcos fled the country, ending his two-decade rule. The peaceful revolution had succeeded, and democracy was restored in the Philippines. The People Power Revolution was a testament to the indomitable spirit of the Filipino people, who despite the odds fought for their freedom and democracy. So, what does a nation take away from such a tumultuous period in its history? The legacy of the martial law era in the Philippines is as complex as the era itself, a tapestry woven with threads of political, social, and economic repercussions. The political landscape was forever altered. The concentration of power during martial law highlighted the dangers of unchecked authority, sparking a national consciousness around the importance of checks and balances in government. On the societal front, the era was a crucible that tested and ultimately strengthened the resolve of the Filipino people. The struggle against oppression galvanized a sense of unity and purpose, igniting a spirit of activism that continues to shape civic engagement today. Yet, it also left deep wounds and divisions that remain evident in the ongoing debates about this period in Philippine history. Economically, the era was marred by widespread corruption and economic mismanagement that left the country grappling with massive debt. The recovery has been long, marked by periods of growth and setbacks, but the lessons learned have been instrumental in shaping economic policies moving forward. But perhaps the most significant impact of the martial law era is the heightened awareness it brought to the importance of remembering the past. The controversies and differing perspectives surrounding this period underscore the critical need for historical understanding. The era serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of forgetting or distorting history, of the dangers of complacency in the face of injustice. The martial law era, with its blend of darkness and resilience, pain and triumph, continues to echo in the collective memory of the nation. It serves as a cautionary tale, a testament to the strength of the Filipino spirit, and a call to vigilance in the ongoing quest for truth, justice and democracy. The martial law era left an indelible mark on the Philippines, a reminder of the resilience of its people and the importance of protecting their hard-won freedoms. Have you ever wondered how much impact a single administration can have on a nation's development? It's a question that's been at the heart of political science for centuries. You see, political reform isn't just about electing new leaders or shifting power dynamics. It's a multifaceted process that encompasses everything from economic policy to social justice initiatives. Taking a closer look at the Philippines, we find a country with a rich yet tumultuous history. The post-Marcos era marked a significant turning point, sparking a nationwide quest for comprehensive reform. Since then, the country has seen a series of administrations, each striving to reshape the political, economic and social landscape in their own way. The path to reform is never easy. It's fraught with challenges and setbacks, but also opportunities for growth and progress. It's a journey that requires persistence, resilience and a shared vision for a better future. As you will see, each administration has played a pivotal role in shaping modern Philippine society. The road to reform began with the Corazon Aquino administration. This period in Philippine history, spanning from 1986 to 1992, was a critical juncture in the country's quest for political reform. The aftermath of the Marcos era left the nation yearning for change, for a return to democratic principles, and it was under Aquino's leadership that this aspiration began to take shape. Aquino's administration was instrumental in restoring democracy in the Philippines. It was a time of transition, of breaking away from the shadows of authoritarian rule and rebuilding the nation's political fabric. The most significant accomplishment of her term was the creation of the 1987 Constitution. This vital document was more than just a set of laws. It was a roadmap for the nation's political journey, a blueprint for reform. The Constitution re-established the separation of powers, safeguarded civil liberties and promoted social justice. It symbolized the nation's resolve to uphold democratic values and set the foundation for political reform. It was a bold statement of the country's commitment to democracy and a testament to Aquino's dedication to the cause of reform. 
However, the road to reform was not smooth. The Aquino administration grappled with numerous challenges, including coup attempts, natural calamities, and economic instability. Yet these challenges did not deter her. Aquino's leadership was a beacon of resilience and determination, illuminating the path towards a democratic Philippines. Despite facing many challenges, the Aquino administration set the stage for future reforms. The task of continuing these reforms fell on the shoulders of the Fidel Ramos administration. Stepping into the political arena in the post-Marcos era, Fidel Ramos had a clear vision to foster economic growth and political stability. His administration was characterized by a steadfast commitment to these goals, and his tenure saw significant strides made in both areas. Ramos understood that a robust economy was key to a stable political climate. He worked diligently to stimulate economic growth, implementing policies that encouraged foreign investment and boosted the nation's infrastructure. His administration oversaw the Philippines' emergence as a newly industrialized country, signaling a shift from an agricultural to a service-oriented economy. But it wasn't just about the economy. Ramos also sought to stabilize the political landscape. One of his most significant moves was the decentralization of the government. By transferring powers from the central government to local units, he aimed to promote efficiency, accountability, and public participation. Another noteworthy aspect of the Ramos administration was its peace process with various rebel groups. The government engaged in peace talks with the Moro National Liberation Front and the Communist Party of the Philippines, marking a departure from the confrontational approach of previous administrations. The Ramos administration advanced the cause of reform, but the journey was far from over. As we peel back the layers of history, it becomes evident that every step taken, every policy implemented was a piece of the larger puzzle of reform in the Philippines. The quest for reform continued with the administrations of Estrada, Arroyo and Aquino III. Let's begin with Joseph Estrada, a charismatic leader who rose to power in 1998. His administration was marked by an increased focus on social reforms, particularly in poverty alleviation. However, his presidency was not without controversy. His term was cut short by allegations of corruption, leading to his impeachment and eventual ousting through the Second People Power Revolution. Next, we have Gloria Macapa Galarroyo, who assumed office following Estrada's removal. She was a seasoned economist who prioritized economic reform and fiscal stability. Under her leadership, the Philippines experienced economic growth. But this progress was marred by allegations of electoral fraud and corruption. Despite these challenges, Arroyo's administration introduced significant measures, such as the expanded Senior Citizens Act and the Renewable Energy Act that positively impacted the lives of Filipinos. Lastly, Benigno Noynoy Aquino III took the helm in 2010. His administration was founded on the promise of Dang Matuid, or Straight Path, this was a commitment to good governance, transparency and anti-corruption. Aquino III's term saw the passing of the landmark Reproductive Health Bill, a controversial yet vital step towards improving women's health in the country. However, his administration also faced criticism over its handling of various national crises, including the tragic Mama Sapano clash and the aftermath of Typhoon Yolanda. In summary, the administrations of Estrada, Arroyo and Aquino III were instrumental in steering the course of political, economic and social reforms in the Philippines. Each faced different challenges, from corruption scandals to natural disasters, that tested their leadership and the country's resilience. Nonetheless, these hurdles did not halt the pursuit of reform, but instead shaped the path it would take. Each administration brought its own challenges and opportunities, further shaping the Philippine society. Most recently, the Duterte administration has taken the helm in the pursuit of reform. Rodrigo Duterte, the 16th president of the Philippines, brought a distinctive approach to the presidency. Known for his tough and unorthodox style, Duterte's administration launched a series of controversial policies that have significantly impacted the nation's reform process. One of the most notable initiatives of Duterte's presidency is the War on Drugs. This policy, aimed at eradicating drug trafficking and substance abuse, has been characterized by its aggressive approach. 
While it has led to the arrest and surrender of numerous drug personalities, the war on drugs has also been criticized for its alleged human rights violations, resulting in a polarized public opinion. Simultaneously, Duterte's administration has also pushed for a shift to federalism. This proposed constitutional change intends to decentralize power, aiming to distribute resources more equitably across the regions of the country. However, the shift to federalism has been met with skepticism, with critics questioning its potential to spur regional development and reduce poverty and inequality. Beyond these major policies, the Duterte administration has navigated other ongoing issues, including territorial disputes in the South China Sea, the continuation of peace talks with rebel groups, and the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Each of these matters has added another layer to the complex task of reform. The Duterte administration's approach to reform has sparked intense debates, reflecting the complex nature of political reform. These debates underscore the importance of ongoing dialogue and the need for nuanced understanding in the quest for meaningful and lasting change. As the Duterte administration continues to shape the nation's path towards reform, its policies and actions will undoubtedly leave a lasting impact on the political, economic and social landscape of the Philippines. The Duterte administration's approach to reform has sparked intense debates, reflecting the complex nature of political reform. As the nation moves forward, the quest for reform continues. The Philippines, a vibrant archipelago, stands at a crossroads. The challenges are many, but so too are the opportunities. One of the key challenges is economic inequality. Despite impressive economic growth in the past decade, the wealth has not been evenly distributed. Many Filipinos still live in poverty, while a few enjoy immense wealth. This economic disparity is a ticking time bomb, threatening the very fabric of Philippine society. There's also the issue of political instability. The country has seen a series of administrations, each with its own vision of reform, yet the political landscape remains fragmented. This lack of continuity disrupts the reform process, leaving many initiatives half-baked and the public disillusioned. But let's not forget the opportunities. The Philippines is a young nation with a median age of just 24 years. This youthful population is tech-savvy, politically aware and hungry for change. They represent a wellspring of potential for the country. Moreover, the Philippines is strategically located in the Asia-Pacific region, a global economic powerhouse. By leveraging this geographical advantage, the country can integrate more deeply into regional economies, fostering growth and prosperity. Looking ahead, the future of reform in the Philippines will be shaped by the leaders who take the helm. They must have the vision to see beyond immediate challenges and seize long-term opportunities. They must have the courage to make tough decisions, even if they are unpopular. And most importantly, they must have the integrity to put the nation's interests above their own. But it's not just about the leaders. The Filipino people too have a crucial role to play. They must hold their leaders accountable, participate actively in the democratic process and contribute to the nation-building effort. They are not just spectators in this grand play of reform, they are its actors. The future of reform in the Philippines lies in the hands of its leaders and its people, a testament to the enduring power of democracy.